Good morning. Welcome to Nervous System Video 2. Um, as far as the notes for this video, they look like this. And you can find them on Canvas. I referenced this in an earlier video. The video I shot just a few minutes ago. If I go to Canvas and Files, there's a file in there that says Pre-AP Bio Notes Body Systems. So Canvas, then Files, and there you go. Um, I always double check my videos before I upload them. I don't watch the whole thing, but I kind of skip forward and make sure the audio is working and that the video is not like 90 degrees off. And at the very end, I said something that was confusing. I said it one way and then explained it a different way. So I said that this part right here, the cerebrum, that the right and the left half of the brain aren't connected. What I was trying to say was they aren't touching. So I gave an analogy like this, they're connected, but like my right fist and my left fist right here, they're, they're technically like not touching right there. I can take a piece of paper and like slide it down until I get to the corpus callosum. But then the corpus callosum does connect those two halves. So they do have a highway of nerve cells. So they can talk to each other. It's just that that part and that part are, are actually, there's like a, a giant crevice like right between the two. So the right and the left half can talk to each other through the corpus callosum. That's why I was saying if we sever the corpus callosum, then now the left and the right halves can't talk. All right, so with that out of the way, what we want to focus on today is how nerve cells actually send a message. So essentially that means like how we have a thought. So this is a nerve cell, and on this picture, it's kind of out of proportion. The cell body right here, the part that holds the nucleus, is a small amount. This long part right here, they call it the axon, is potentially several feet long. So I have nerve cells, individual nerve cells with axons that are say four feet long that go from the base of my spinal cord, right about where my genes sit, all the way down my leg, this is, these are individual cells, all the way out to say my big toe. And those are the ones that can sense like if, I, if I'm touching something or if I'm sending a message down to my big toe. Um, so I have nerve cells that are this long. So I have nerve cells that are this long in my body. They're not this thick, but they are this long. And real quick, just to give you kind of an example, the difference between a nerve and a nerve cell. What we call a nerve, um, for example, if you hold your elbow at like a 90 degree angle and you hit it right between there and there, kind of relax your hand, you can find your ulnar nerve. And if you kind of hit that, you can feel like electricity shooting up and down towards your pinky finger. Well, that's the ulnar nerve. A nerve is just a bundle of many neurons, nerve cells. So if this is a nerve and I cut this cord open, isn't it full of like tons of, tons of copper wire? I know I'm switching back and forth between my analogy and, and a nerve, but this, this is a cord. If I cut it open, it doesn't just have like one thick core of copper wire. It has like several strands. Same thing, if this was my ulnar nerve and I cut it open, it doesn't have an individual neuron in there. It has many neurons bundled together, almost like a braided rope, um, minus the braiding. Okay, so how is it that we actually send a message from one area to another? And how quick is it? Like, if I'm touching this, then information is going this way along my nerve cell. It has to go all the way up my arm to my spinal cord up to my brain, and my brain is like, yeah, I felt that. And so let's say when I barely touch this, that I don't know how many neurons fire, but X amount of neurons. And then if I hit it harder, like that, now 5X or 10X, five or 10 times as many neurons fire. And so when I have a few nerve cells send electricity in my brain, my brain says, feel this, and it's a gentle tap. Uh, gentle tap. If I hit it harder, then now more nerve cells send impulses and my brain says, feel this. And it creates the feeling of like, you know, more like I'm really hitting my hand hard against the surface. So it's all in your brain. And we, we know that because again, what we just demonstrated a second ago was if I hit my ulnar nerve right there, then I feel a sensation right here. So that ulnar nerve goes out here to my finger and it goes all the way up. Anytime it fires, my brain is gonna say, feel a sensation in your pinky. Well, I'm not touching my pinky, but if I can like smash the nerve and get it to send a message to my brain, my brain will say, ah, 
I felt that in my pinky and it's going to create that feeling of like electricity in my pinky, which is weird as heck. Um, real quick, let me jot down the time. So I probably started about 10, 15 ish. That way I know about how long to time my videos for. So this is a nerve cell. This is this, and we'll actually spend most of our time on this board. So in a nerve cell, it turns out that we have a voltage. So it's not an analogy, it's kind of like voltage or something like that, like it's real voltage. So your nerve cells rest at about 70 millivolts. Now the inside compared to the outside, the outside is more positive, the inside is more negative. So from the inside, we'll say negative 70. Kind of like if um, you, have, you have zero dollars, you're completely broke, but I owe $70, then when you compare my bank account to yours, I'm negative $70 compared to you. My first 70 just gets me up to even, like I'm $70 in debt. So the inside is relatively speaking more negative. If, if I was an electrician and I thought like this, this outlet down here was bad, I could take a voltmeter and see if it's producing the proper number of volts. Um, by the way, millivolts, so those are thousandths, thousandths of a volt. Picture like a, like a AA or a AAA battery. Those are somewhere around like a volt and a half, it'll say on them. Picture a nine volt battery. You might have a smoke detector in your home. Hopefully you do. And those are the kind of rectangular ones. Those are nine volts. And then picture like, you know, a car battery. So I drive a, an SUV. Um, and so my battery is like 150, 160 bucks. And when you put it in the car, it's like, thunk. And that's only, um, in a real life situation, it produces about 12 volts. Outside of a car, it produces at max 14.4 volts. So voltage doesn't tell you how big a battery is. If a nine volt battery is this big, and a like 20, 30 pound battery for my car is 14.4 volts, then what's a, what's a volt and what's current? And how does that relate to this? So the first thing we wanna do is just do a quick introduction of how electricity works. So most students take physics when they're a junior. So in the future, you'll be kind of getting a different version of this, a more thorough version of this, but picture a battery. If I looked at a battery, let's say that this was a AA or a AAA, there'll be a plus on one side and a minus on the other. That way I know when I put it in my remote control, you know, put the battery in this way or this way. And essentially um, what a battery is doing is this. It's got some type of metal in there. You might have heard of like alkaline batteries or cadmium batteries or lithium ion batteries. They're telling you what kind of metals are in there. And I essentially have two pieces of metal that are separated from each other. One side is more positive, one is negative. So what do you think makes the positive side positive or the, the negative side negative? Well, batteries are chemical um, in nature. So generally when we think of chemistry and I think of positives and negatives, I think protons are positive, neutrons are neutral, and electrons are negative. So which, which is more likely? Do I have a bunch of extra electrons over here? Or do I have a bunch of extra protons over here? Or how does that work? Well, keep in mind like protons, that's like the nucleus. So electrons moving around, that's common. Static electricity is electrons moving around. Electricity in a wire, we call it electricity because it's electrons that move through the wire. It's not called proticity, it's called electricity because electrons are moving. So it turns out on one of the pieces of metal, I have a bunch of electrons that are available to do work. They aren't working yet, but they're available to do work. Almost like when you guys learn about potential and kinetic energy, I might have a dam and you know it's 50 feet up there and there's water up there. That, that water has potential energy. If I open the dam and the water falls, it's gonna crash down and do work. So I've got this battery and I've got a bunch of extra electrons on this piece of metal. Not very many extra electrons on this piece of metal. And so let's say that this is a six volt battery. How do I make it a seven volt battery? The battery doesn't have to get bigger. I don't have to like draw my battery bigger. I just need, there you go, now it's seven volts. A greater separation of charge. So 
to define voltage more like a chemist or kind of like how we have been defining stuff this year, you could say it's a, um, it's a separation of charge, but it's also just a concentration difference. So I'm separating charged particles, negatives, electrons, but if I have a high concentration here and a low concentration here, then I have voltage. When I have a bigger difference between the two, then now I have higher voltage. Now it's 8 volts. Doesn't mean the battery is bigger, just how big of a difference is there between the haves and the have-nots. So that's voltage. So we are going to define voltage as a separation of charged particles. Separation of charge. With electricity, it's electrons. Okay, what would happen if I took a wire and I connected the two sides? All right, well now, if this is a good conductor, a wire, it should be, then those electrons are going to move from high to low concentration. Kind of like in chemistry, um, things diffuse from high to low concentration. So you can think of it as the diffusion of electrons, except they happen to be charged. And so now they move. So the electrons are literally going from this piece of metal and attaching to this piece of metal. So as the electrons move, this guy is losing some, and this guy is gaining some. And as they're moving, they flow kind of like water, so we call that current. So current is the flow of charged, charged particles. All right, so that's going to go high to low. They keep moving, keep moving, and then eventually we reach equilibrium. So once we reach equilibrium, there's no net movement. Yeah, an electron might move that way, and an electron moves back this way, but there's no net movement, no, no new work really being done. And so now my battery is dead. If it's a regular old Duracell, then now I, I dispose of it. I can't use it again. But if it was like a rechargeable battery in my phone or my laptop or something like that, then what I do is I plug it into the wall, and I shove all those electrons back to where they came where they came from. So when I plug this in, my phone, for example, I take all those electrons, shove them back over here, and now I'm ready to use my phone another day. I'll use it the next day. I shove all the electrons over, shove them back. The problem is that when electrons move from here to here, back and forth, back and forth, I'm never 100% getting all the electrons back to like it was. And so that's why when I first get my phone, it might hold a charge for um, two days if I just leave it on or whatever. A couple of years later, it doesn't hold a charge for two days. Now it only holds a charge for a day or half a day or whatever, because eventually I'm not pushing all these back. So the voltage is less. I need a stark difference between high and low to have a good strong voltage. If my car is messed up, um, I know most of you guys at this point in the year are probably around 15. Maybe you just turned 15 or you're turning 15 soon. So you're probably not driving yet, legally anyway. But um, if I think that my car battery is bad, like maybe when I start my car it just sort of sounds like it really struggled, I can go to say AutoZone or something and um, I can basically take out my battery and they can test it. So they'll try to give it a full charge and they'll see like, hey, this battery's out of your car, it ought to be able to produce at least, you know, 12, 13, 14 volts, whatever their magic number is. And if it doesn't, then they're like, yeah, your battery's like nearing the end of its life. You know, a, a battery out of a car, brand new, should produce 14 volts, 14.4 volts, and yours is producing like 11. So yeah, your, your battery is dying. Do you want to go ahead and replace it now? That type of thing. So voltage and current. Now what we want to get into in this video is how does that relate to a nerve cell? Well, in a nerve cell, we need to create voltage and we need to create current. Somehow I have a voltage of 70 millivolts. Again, the inside is more negative than the outside. So we could just as easily say out here is plus 70 millivolts compared to this. And so the way that we do it is with these. So this is a channel and it's got a gate on it. And this one right here is a sodium ion channel. Sodium ion channel. So that's Na plus channel. So these are all Na plus ions, sodium ions. Now, if you look in more detail, because again, this is the Bio 1, the ninth grade version of the nervous system, 
If you look in more details, there are other channels along here. There are some sodium leak channels and potassium leak channels and stuff like that. We're avoiding that for right now because not a lot of action is gonna happen with them. So I've got a bunch of sodium ions outside. Ion means it's charged and not very many inside. So what did I just create? Sodium is charged, it's a charged particle. I've got a bunch outside, separation, and not very many inside. So don't I have a separation of charged particles? Doesn't that look a lot like the battery? I've got a bunch of charged particles, separation, not very many. I got a bunch of charged particles, separation, not very many. I mean, I could even draw my battery with a little thing on the top. And there's my separator. Again, I could draw my battery diagram right there if I wanted. So I've got a sodium battery set up. Well, it turns out um, I've got another set of charged particles, potassium. And I've got a whole lot of potassium, K plus, inside of the cell and not very many outside. So this little orange guy right here is a potassium ion channel. Again, ion just means it's charged. All right, so these aren't just channels though, they have gates. So they don't just call them sodium ion channels, they call them gated sodium ion channels. And gated potassium ion channels. Okay, it's not just that though. We also name them based off of what opens them up. So in my mouth, we'll learn a little bit later on, I might have um, some voltage, or I might have some chemically gated sodium ion channels. What opens up the gate? A chemical that, that I taste. So if sugar hits my tongue, my brain will say sweet. Um, I might have some that are open with sound or touch or something like that, mechanical stimulation, mechanoreceptors. So what opens these is voltage. So this guy right here is a, the full name is a voltage gated sodium ion channel. A long name, but it tells you how it works. It's a channel. It only lets in sodium um, ions selectively. It's got a gate and voltage can open that gate. Same thing with this guy down here. Voltage gated potassium channel. Okay, now. We've got voltage, we want to create current. And so after we're done with current, then that'll be the, the end of this video and we'll um, kind of come back on the next video and expand a little bit. But current, current was the flow of charged particles. So how would I get sodium to move? How would I get those sodium ions to move? Well, if I could open that gate, so if I could somehow get some voltage, we'll see how um, in another video. But if I can somehow get these gates to open, like this, so this gate opens up, just like a gate um, or a door uh, to a room, then now won't sodium rush in from high to low? It will. So it does. Aren't charged particles now flowing? Yeah, so that's current. So I now got sodium to rush in. Here goes the sodium in. So inside of my nerve cell, I'm getting more positive, right? A bunch of positive stuff just entered. If if the inside of this nerve cell represented my bank account and I'm at negative 70, and all of a sudden you start giving me pluses, I'm climbing out of debt. You start giving me pluses and I'm like negative 68, negative 67, 66, 65, and so forth. All right, so that happens for a while, and I'm either gonna shut the door to stop it, or eventually there would be no net flow anyway. Eventually I get to equilibrium. So we either reach equilibrium or I shut the door. There are several different versions, different flavors of sodium ion channels. Okay, then that door shuts, let's say. So there you go, it's shut. I'm equal on both sides. Now, the potassium door opens. This voltage swing over here provided the voltage to open the gate for this, so, for this potassium ion channel. So, potassium's in high concentration inside, not much outside, so it's gonna flow. Current flowing out, great. So I got an electrical message to travel that far, but I've got to get it all the way down the nerve cell. I'm touching this, and I just got an electrical message to travel that far, but I need to just travel all the way. Back to this. If this is plugged into the wall, I need the electrons to travel all the way 
along this wire and we've only traveled a fraction of the distance that we need. So I need it to go again. Okay, cool. Well, I could open up this voltage-gated sodium ion channel right here. If I do that, will there be any net flow in or out? Well, no, because I'm pretty much at equilibrium. So, okay, that's not gonna work. If I open up this passing door, no net flow. So what I need to do is I have this black box right here. And this black box is a pump. Remember, the definition of a pump means it requires energy from the cell. So this particular pump is gonna run on ATP. So I've got this pump, and what it does is it's the resetter. If I want to do the sodium, then the potassium, and I want to do it again, sodium, potassium, sodium, potassium. I want to keep repeating this, then I need to like, sodium, potassium, reset. Sodium, potassium, reset. You know, in, out, reset. In, out, reset, all the way down. So it's the resetter. And what it'll do is it'll shove the potassium back in and it'll push the, potassium, the sodium back out. So it's a pump, and what does it pump? Sodium and potassium ions. So we call it a sodium potassium pump. Some books call it an ATPase because it, it runs on ATP, so you might see it called sodium potassium ATPase. ATPase means enzyme that breaks down ATP. And now I'm basically just ready to go again. So here we go. Open up this door, sodium in. Open up this door, potassium out. Burn some ATP, reset with the pump. Sodium in, potassium out, reset. Now here's what's so weird. Diffusion, diffusion, active transport. Diffusion, diffusion, active transport. Diffusion, diffusion, active transport. Yet, how long does it take for that message to get from my finger to my brain? Like, I'm touching this board. How long did that electrical message take to get there? Isn't it going like probably that fast, if not faster, like it seems instantaneous? Now, no, part of it is how long does it take the message to get from my eyes to my brain to see it, but so, what just happened? Diffusion, diffusion, pump. Diffusion, diffusion, pump. I don't even know how many sodium and potassium gated ion channels and sodium potassium pumps we go in and out of to get the message up to my brain. But it's diffusion, diffusion, pump. And like it still seems almost instantaneous, which is kind of crazy if you think about it. All right. Um, based off of time, 15.25. Um, all right, we'll do one last thing on this video. Um, some nerve cells are slower and some nerve cells are faster. So some nerve cells fire as slow as two, maybe three, maybe four miles an hour, and some of them can fire faster, upwards of 200 plus miles an hour. I've seen in books where they go as high as 300. I've seen other books where they're like, no, they're more like 200, so I'll go with 250. So why is it that some nerve cells fire at two, three, four miles an hour, and others can do 250. I understand from a functional standpoint, some things don't require fast computing, but what makes one nerve cell fire, you know, almost a hundred times faster? If we're, if we're looking at two miles an hour versus 200, that's a hundred times faster. So I'm just gonna go with that, a hundred times faster. Um, well, the thicker you make a nerve, the more electricity you can pass through. Picture, um, I don't know, a water hose. If I have a water hose that's this big around, how much water, how much information, if water is information, how much information can I send through this hose versus if I've got like a fire hose that big around, how much water can I send through per minute? So I can make nerve cells bigger, but it turns out these nerve cells aren't really any bigger. So what we do is if I've got a nerve cell that looks like this, um, yeah, I'll draw right here. So here's a nerve cell. That's supposed to be this nerve cell, that's a nerve cell, a neuron. Let's say that this one is identical. So if they were identical, I know they're not, I'm not a very good artist, um, but if they were identical, then they should carry impulses at the same speed. So this one right here is slow. Let's say it goes two to three miles an hour, and this one goes 200. So almost 100 times faster. 
The reason that it fires faster is because this one is covered with this white layer of stuff. You can see it on this picture. I don't know how well you can see because it's white against a white background, but it's called myelin sheath. Sheath is just like it ensheaths something, like there's a kind of black rubbery plasticky sheath um, around this copper wiring. And so this is called myelin sheath. And what myelin sheath does is it makes them fire faster. How? Well, it does kind of insulate the nerve cell a little bit. So these guys are a little bit less late, likely to like leak out. Um, but really what it does is it allows for sodium and potassium to skip down the nerve cell. Instead of walking baby steps, it's able to like take jumps. Um, apparently the Latin root for jumping is like saltaire or something like that. So they call it saltatory propagation. So here I send a regular electrical impulse. They'll call it an action potential. This was an action potential. And this one's going, you know, I might have brown and orange. When I say go, the brown and orange represents sodium and potassium, and it's like one, two, three, go. And I have to go in and out of, let's say, millions of sodium and potassium channels and pumps. Okay, with this one, it turns out that myelin is lipid. It's basically a cell that's wrapped around the, the nerve cell, and there's not much cytoplasm or anything else, so it's mostly like lipidy because it's, it's phospholipids. So it's basically a, a bundle of fat that's around there. The okay, well, thing about fats, think back to our first unit, fats are nonpolar. If something like sodium with a plus or potassium with a plus, ions are there, is that polar or nonpolar if I have pluses or minuses? That's polar. So myelin is nonpolar and sodium potassium ions are polar. Do polar and nonpolar things mix very well? No, that's why polar water and nonpolar oil don't mix. I can put them in a cup, stir them together, and the lipids will still separate out. If the lipids weigh less, they'll float on top because they're less dense. If the lipids were more dense, they would be underneath, but they would be separate. Okay, so now, here's what it looks like with myelin sheath. When sodium and potassium ions start going in and out, they go in, out, in, out, in, out, and then they get to a myelin sheath and then they jump. So they get to the end faster. So instead of going in and out of let's say um, 100,000 ion channels, if I cover up 90% of them, then I only go in and out of 10,000 ion channels. So how to get to the end faster. If I have to take um, 10,000 baby steps to get to the other side of the room, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, like this, 10,000 baby steps, that's like this. But if I get to do like five or 10 baby steps, take a step, five or 10 baby steps, take a step or a jump, I get over to this side of the room faster. So baby steps, or when I get to myelin, baby steps and then jump. Baby steps, I get to myelin, jump. And so that's why uh, myelinated neurons fire faster. Myelin sheath is mostly lipid. What color are a lot of lipids in animals? Picture the meat counter. When I look at um, steak, the muscle tissue is red, and the fat tissue is white, so it's white. Didn't we say earlier um, in a previous video that when I start looking at a brain, there's white matter and gray matter? Like this, nerve cells are gray, and unless you're covering those gray nerve cells with white myelin sheath. So this right here is white because of myelin. The edges, the gray matter on the outside of the brain are not myelinated, and so that's why they're gray. All right. Um, our next video, we've got a little bit more to say about this. Basically, we're going to be focusing on like how we sense, um, you know, one of our senses, taste, smell, touch, whatever. And then we're going to also be looking at how a nerve cell can talk to another nerve cell with these chemicals right here that transmit messages between neurons, neurotransmitters. Um, the neurotransmitters you've likely heard of are like dopamine, um, addiction pathways work off of dopamine, um, serotonin. Uh, a lot of our antidepressants, uh, Zoloft, Pro Prozac, stuff like that, they work on the serotonin system. And so we'll relate that to, um, you know, common, common human 
issues like depression and addiction. So thanks for listening.